My name is Abigail, and I'm a student in Professor Marina Pugliese's contemporary art course at California College of the Art. I'm going to introduce World Nationalism. This year, the theme of Creative Citizen series is World Mutualism. The series is exploring the intergenerational symbiotic relationship, networks, and strategies developing within different communities, spaces, disciplines, and territories. Each event in the series is connected to one of the pillars of the communal flower, a model for understanding communality in the Asian philosophy and the daily practice of various indigenous nations in Southern Mexico. This event explores the pillar assembly according to the Lost connection with her. Jackson, do you want to step in and, and uh, oh no, there uh, she is. I just disconnected. According to the communal flower, the importance of the assembly resides in that it is here that we manifest our co collective needs, where we contemplate alternative of well-being that satisfy us solutions and where we decide the path that will define the destiny of our community. Thank you, Abigail. Ezra? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, before we begin, uh, we'd like to make a land acknowledgement. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huchin and Yelamu also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively on unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. We endeavor to honor indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. And if you are unsure of whose land you are currently residing on, you can uh, always visit nativeland.ca. And now I'll uh, pass it to Marina for a few words. Thank you, Ezra. I'm Marina Pugliese. I'm professor of contemporary art at Havoc and the head of public art for the city of Milan. And this is the last of our three seminars. Um, in the first, we met with Kendall Henry and we talked about breast practices uh, in order to democratize the decision-making process in public art. In the second seminar, we talked with uh, Romy Crawford about how to memorialize the underrepresented communities in uh, ephemeral ways. And uh, today I have the pleasure to welcome Joel Garcia, who is an artist and uh, an activist. And um, uh, today um, I also wanna thank CCA for CCA and the Creative Citizen in Action program uh, on fluid mutualism, which funded this uh, three seminars and to thank again, uh, Brindis and Jamie for all the help. And I think that uh, today's talk of Joel is really, you know, um, concluded including in the best possible way our, our uh, series uh, in which it really uh, broaches the topic of uh, uh, indigenous uh, um, strategies uh, of uh, um, connecting communities uh, and also to reconciliate with uh, uh, complicated history. Um, so thank you, Joel. And um, I pass the mic to Acacia to talk about uh, Joel's bio. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Acacia. I'm also a student in Marina's class. Um, so Joe Garcia Huicho is an indigenous artist and cultural organizer that uses indigenous based frameworks to center those most impacted and artist based strategies such as printmaking, installations, creative action and altar making 
to raise awareness of issues facing underserved communities, youth, and other targeted populations. In various roles, he has worked with indigenous communities across borders in support of issues of land, access, and self-determination. His work explores healing and reconciliation, as well as memory and place. He is a former fellow of Monument Lab and the Intercultural Leadership Institute, as well as an artist in residence at Oxy Arts and AIR Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass the mic to Joel. Good morning, everybody, um, or good day, uh, depending on where you're at. Um, thank you all for those for those introductions and land acknowledgements. Um, I love the inclusion of elders in that. Um, I when when Marina and I first spoke about doing this this session, um, things were a little bit different here in LA. Um, in the last month or so, a lot of stuff has kind of happened, which is great um, because, and if you hear my dog snoring, sorry. <laughs> He's in the background snoring. I don't know if you can hear him. Um, when, we, when we spoke, you know, like there was movement around this work, but a lot of this also still felt very like theoretical in practice. Um, and so, I'm gonna start by kind of just going through a quick overview of where things are at and I'll share my screen so, I can, so you can see these slides. And so last month during Indigenous Peoples Day, I think this is getting cut off, but it's fine. I think it's included in the next slide. Um, the city of Los Angeles um, made a number of announcements. Um, and some of this is some of this is performative because you know government's gonna always want to take credit for stuff, um, but a lot of this work has been done on the back end by community members um, and other other activist organizers. Um, so these were the announcements that happened on Indigenous Peoples Day um, last month. Um, and you know, some of this is like fancy city talk. So when they says like indigenous cultural easement at the park and other areas across Los Angeles to give local indigenous people space to practice traditional ceremonies. Um, that's their way of saying like, we figured out, we haven't figured out how to give land back yet. Because the goal of all of this, at least for me and a couple other folks is, is land return. It is the agency of, of or in the, the you know the sovereignty respecting and supporting the sovereignty of indigenous peoples in in their homelands. Um, then the removal of Father Junipero Serra's name from from the park at Olvera, where where one of the statues was toppled, a formal apology, um, redesigning the the flag for Los Angeles. Los Angeles has one of the ugliest flags ever, um, and then also changing the name of the Christopher Columbus Highway. Um, so this is all great. This is stuff that folks have worked on. This isn't coming from the city. Like the city didn't decide we're gonna do this. This is like the result of a lot of work. Um, and I'm also like really happy that what they're proposing isn't like a final set thing. It's more of like, we gotta figure this out. And for me, the inclusion of community in these processes is extremely important. And I'll touch on that over, over the course of this presentation. Um, so in a sense, they don't know what they're doing, which is great, but there's an intention there. And I think this is where artists um, where Yeah, this is definitely what these, these space in which artists live and are able to find um, able to find loopholes within policy are able to imagine ways new policies can work. Um, can create processes for for community engagement, whether you know very formal through through you know a meeting or through creative practices, right? Bringing people together to make stuff to then figure out what it is that people want. These are the spaces that I think artists can really really thrive when we talk about um, 
you know, placing artists in, in departments um, or this idea of a creative strategist. So for me, this is, this is great. This is a major step in, in, in not just here in Los Angeles, but like this work is happening now on a national level and an international level, but on a national level where cities are taking these things much, much more serious. Um, and Los Angeles is a massive place um, with the largest, you know, the largest population of, of native and indigenous folks um, outside of Mexico City on this continent. So um, it is important for folks like me who identify as indigenous and live on somebody else's homeland, like I'm an uninvited guest here. It is important for folks like me to, to take this work serious and to do what we can to make this happen. Um, and then this past or this week, Monument Lab also announced the support of like 10 teams nationwide um, to really expand on some of this work. We're one of those teams. Um, and for me, this is, this is important because, so these are the 10 teams across the country. Um, for me, this is really important because within within this 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 cohort of folks, there's three indigenous communities: Rapid City, Duneta, and Los Angeles. Normally, we'd be lucky if we have one one team with indigenous representation. Um, Monument Lab is is a is an entity that is doing amazing work with with the intentionality around diversity and equity that um, that folks should be, you know, moving with. Um, they're really doing the work. So look at what they're doing. Um, they do a lot of this work alongside government and other like, you know, institutions. Um, so there are a lot to learn from them. Uh, but for us here in Los Angeles, this is this is what um, what our project consists of. I'm the only one from this team that is not Tongva, the rest of the team is Tongva. Those are the first pe one of the first peoples of Los Angeles. So for me, it is important to um, not try to make myself as an artist the center of these things, but serve as a conduit um, for for this work. So our intention, way back when we wrote this grant, was to push the city to return land. So we're already there. The city's already agreed. Like this is important to do. Let's figure it out. Um, but their pace of doing things is way different than the pacing that like the rest of the world lives, that people live. And it usually takes a lot, lot longer. So we don't want to take, we don't want to take their, their timeline, their time frame. Um, and we felt we needed to do a lot of this ourselves. And that's kind of the, that's, that's, that's kind of the way it's been the last five or so years. So one of the things that happened when we removed the Columbus statue was that the city approved, of, uh, they approved the process by which they would install or help design and install um, wayfinder, wayfinding markers and signage across the city that would be more representative of Valley Source peoples. Um, none of that has moved forward. The money has sat there, like it just, you know, the city approves things, but then nobody, nobody does them. Um, so we don't, we, we felt that these are opportunities for us to really push things forward. So what we're going to do is we're self-commissioning ourselves to do all this signage, um, to create all these different markers and just install them DIY style, guerrilla style, you know, put on a yellow vest, helmet and install them and then push the city to like adopt these things and then install more because they have the money to do it. They've already approved this. We want to incorporate like technology into this so that folks can walk up to these signs, use their phones, either hear stories directly from, from um, the various tribal communities here um, and just learn more, right? We're, we're in an age where phones can do amazing things. So let's use that technology. And ultimately with pushing for this piece of land to be returned, um, the creation of a learning lab of sorts so all this, this is all, this is all the stuff we'll be prototyping. A hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money um, to do this type of work. So this is kind of like just our opportunity to get it off the ground and then really push the city and the county to to put up some money. Um, 
So this is this is an idea that well, I mean, literally, I just found this online, like Googled, like I don't know, shipping container um, museum or whatever, and found this, slapped it onto a Google Maps rendering of the park, and then sent this in, and folks were like, "Oh, this is great! Let's 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 do this." Um, so it won't look like this, but <laughs> this is the idea. Um, and we also want to move away from this, you know, these old notions of like museums and and how indigenous people are represented in these spaces. So the idea of a, like a learning lab or, you know, something that also kind of alludes to the development of like cultural practices and traditions, not just like relegating even those practices to, to the past. Like we want to make sure that we're talking about the futurity of people. Um, so that'll be the concept to this space. And, you know, we're just at in, in the ideation stage of it. So we're hoping to have something more concrete come April when the city of LA is entering like its budget negotiations. So there's a lot of research that, that I think as artists we need to do, we need to know like what things are happening out there, who is doing what, who can make a decision on your behalf um, to then have the resources to, to put this into practice. So we wanna get, we wanna make sure that we get this all done by April so that we can push the city to input, you know, include it in their budget and pay for it. It's our money anyway, so we just gotta figure out how to get access to that cash. Um, the other thing that's happening is the county side of, of, of all of this. Um, the county just released a, a RFP to, to develop a formal land acknowledgement for the entire county. So massive area of land that, in, that incorporates so many different tribal communities. Um, figure out what their policies around land access are too, because we want the county to return land as well. The county has been able to give land to nonprofits um, but the weird thing is that both the county and the city have no process to give land to tribal communities because within the state charter, um, indigenous peoples don't exist as entities. And as bizarre as that sounds, that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of where things are at. Um, so if you're hearing about like land return for, for some of the tribes up in Northern California, um, the tribes have had to establish like 501c3s or like, you know, these nonprofit models in order to receive land, which is, you know, like I said, bizarre that within California's, you know, the California state charter, a state that pretends to be very progressive, indigenous people don't exist as, as like formal entities. Um, so a lot of work to be done. Um, so we applied for this, RF, like to, to facilitate this process, which is gonna be super difficult but again, it's the way of bringing in like creative action into these government, you know, processes that can be very dry and, and frankly, people distrust. Um, they, you know, people really distrust these 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 forms of doing things. Um, and for us, it was important to to be able to, um, as artists, bring that into bring that mindset into this work. So that's what's happened. Um, the city also has like. Put together this working memory group that is that is trying to account for all these untold histories of Los Angeles. Everything from indigenous people to labor um, to other community groups or, or cultural groups that have been um, that have been you know kind of erased from Ali's um, Ali's history. A lot of a lot of you know a lot of tragic stuff. Um, but this is all the result of some of the actions here in Los Angeles, some of the advocacy on the part of tribal communities um, and, uh, and other, other cultural groups like, you know, and entities like the Chinese American Museum. Um, and like I said, like the city can approve all kinds of things, um, but when they happen, it takes forever. Like the Chinese American Museum just got approved about $250,000 for a memorial, but they don't expect that memorial to be produced anytime soon. Um, so what does that actually do for people who are working to, to bring healing and some form of reconciliation into their community? It sucks. So that's why I believe in really like, as artists, 
taking the liberty of self-commissioning ourselves to do these things in partnership with community. And that's the work, that partnership, that building trust is where um, I'll jump into that in a little bit. Um, well, actually, let's just go into it. So how do we get here? How do we get to this point? In 2017, here in Los Angeles, the city approved um, the replacement of, of Christopher Columbus Day or Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. And one of the things that for me, having, having worked at Grand Park or having programmed at Grand Park for a number of years, and also as a teenager going through that park to get to um, you know, places where I was working at either in downtown or over in, in Silver Lake. I mean, I grew up in the punk rock scene, so I worked at a record label for a bit. The Christopher Columbus statue was something that I saw near my bus stop. So I made like this comment of like, that's weird that they're gonna celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day at Grand Park. I guess people don't know that there's a Christopher Columbus statue like right in the middle of this park. Um, so that got a lot of stuff, you know, it got people like, you know, pretty frazzled and, and people moved to say like, you know, kind of like WTF, <laughs> like really, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, so that began the process to remove the statue. It took a lot longer than, 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 than it should have, um, primarily because of two things. The, the value placed on the statue by the county. It's part, of, it's part of their art collection. So this was gifted to the county by the Knights of Columbus back in 1970, I believe. And because it was gifted to the arts department, it is listed on there as an art piece. And so the idea of removing it or removing an art piece was like just too much for them to, to like even process, um, much less the assessing it from their collection. Because at that point, a couple of years back, the word deaccession was like a bad word. I know, I know now deassessing stuff from, from collections is, 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 is a strategy that a lot of museums are using to diversify collections. Um, but I know back then around that time, I think the Baltimore Museum had DSS and sold off pieces to pay for like rent. And that's the kind of stuff you don't want to do. So it freaked people out too, to even consider DSSing anything. Um, so a lot of back and forth went on between um, formal entities like the Native American Indian Commission, who was part of these conversations, and then community folks like myself, who just said like, we just need to take this down. And in some point in the middle there, we found out that the county was lying to us, that at the same time that they're telling us that they want to remove this, they're offering this, this statue to um, entities like the Archdiocese here in Los Angeles. Like, we'll just give you this statue, you know? Um, and at that point it was like, okay, we need to take this to the next level. And so then I put together this zine showing people how to remove a monument on their own. Um, and it freaked people out. It really freaked people out and it got things going. We also went, a friend of mine, another artist, Tanya Melendez, and I went to turn this statue into an altar. Um, this was happening at the same time that Hurricane Maria had hit the islands in Puerto Rico. And you, hear, you heard nothing on TV, nothing in media about it. All you heard was, you know, like Trump's campaign. Um, so we decided to go, you know, it was, this was during Day of the Dead. At the time I was, I was um, part of an organization who had been programming um, a community altar night at Grand Park for a number of years. So for us, it was very simple. It just turned it into an altar and, and obscure it from public view. Police showed up, everything. Um, and because the arts organization I work for is, is a pretty well-known organization, self Help Graphics, um, they took things very serious. Like the supervisor took it very serious that like, the director of an organization that they're supporting would, would move and do something like this. But to me, it was like, we're community members. We're gonna, we're gonna take action when we need to take action. Um, so like I, like I said, <laughs> I grew up in the punk rock scene and zine making is, is, is part of it and something that I learned doing then. And so passing on information, really well-researched information uh, <laughs> is important. And so we put this out there and, it, and it, it got the ball rolling. It really got the ball rolling. And you notice here in option A, simply removing these, these screws, I'll get back to that. Um, so a couple months later, 
statues removed and you see here this plate i don't know if you can see my mouse scrolling you see those little three holes there there's a set of um three screws on each side literally that's all it took to remove the statue this county worker walked up with a screwdriver not even a power drill unscrewed each pole um and that was it simple and um I knew that that was possible because we did research into how these things were installed. Um, but you always feel that some of these things are, are, you're conditioned to think that some of these things are so permanent that the most straightforward way to remove something seems like the most impossible way to do it. That it's gonna take so much effort um, to get these things done. And in, in actuality, they're, because many of these things were installed very cheaply, um they were mass produced they're also installed very ineffectively like they're like it takes very little effort um so it was removed and it has led to many things one of the things that happened was that the county also put a proposal together to do programming around um in response to this initially they had told us that it would take two hundred fifty thousand dollars to remove the statue in actuality it cost $2,500 for the crane. That was it. Um, so there was some money left over, not $250,000, was something like $13,000 left over to do some programming. So we pushed them to do programming versus like this temporary installation. Um, and so we also worked with them to ensure that the RFP process, the, pro the process for applying was gonna be equitable because we know that for civic art here in, in, in LA, and I imagine in many other places, the folks who get awarded these projects are primarily straight white men. So we wanted to change that. So we're changing things. Um, we're changing the way count, the county does things along the way, looking at their processes and, and, and changing things or adding things so that it's more equitable. So two Tongva artists actually ended up um, getting awarded these two, these two small grants. One was a temporary installation at Grand Park, Mercedes Dorame, um, and the other was a storytelling project by a uh, Tongva cultural bearer named Cindy Ovitre, who also teaches at Cal State Long Beach. And so this happened this past, about a year ago now, last, last November. Um, and then we'll talk about the Cerro Statue now, and I'll, I'll share this video with you. enough is enough. A time when we have to dismantle the system that doesn't work and has never worked for our people of color. Grab the ropes, everybody. Get a rope. Everybody, grab a rope. Take a rope. Grab a rope. Everybody, grab a rope. Everybody, grab a rope. This doesn't feel like a celebration. This is just the beginning of healing that needs to occur amongst our people. This is a man who has created genetic trauma for myself amongst our ancestors. These ancestors of ours, they struggled loving themselves because somebody like this told them that they were disgusting, told them that they were, they were useless other than for sex and for slavery. And because of somebody like that, we struggle today as a community. These statues and monuments which have been erected all over our sacred unceded lands are constant reminders of the dominant society on their need to celebrate the wrongs of the past. We cannot teach love and compassion to our youth when they receive a completely different narrative in schools and outside of tribal communities. It is time to teach the truth and remove the lies and depression. It is time to remove the commemorations of hate, bigotry, and colonization. So Soon after that, um, the following week, this statue was removed. Um, and just the idea of the threat of community tearing this down, um, Parks and Recs, who 
I guess, also owns or has a collection of statues, removed it um, overnight. Um, they wanted to avoid all the all the hoopla of the press. Um, so the day prior, literally a week after they removed the Sarah statue, there was an action there where this statue was obscured from public view temporarily. Um, that night it was removed. Um, a couple weeks later, back at Olvera Street where the Sarah statue was, the same thing happened. This is um, the statue of King Carlos of Spain, who who is the one who gave the order to settle Los Angeles and and build a, you know build a, a settlement here. Um, that was obscured from public view. And you know, going back to these places and and reclaiming them is also important. So this is a ceremony that was held um, last fall, not this fall, but like last fall um, during the the fall equinox. The, the Sarah statue was removed during the summer solstice. So also using like, you know, these, when we talk about like indigenous space strategies, um, when and how things happen are also important. So using these shifts in, in, in time, we were talking about the seasons earlier as folks were jumping on, is these are important markers of time where things, you know, when, when ceremonies take place. So we wanted to make sure that those frameworks are also being brought into these processes. Um, I'll stop there for now. Um, with, with the Sarah statue, about two weeks later, the city um, passed another resolution calling what we did an act of civil disobedience because there didn't exist a process within the city to remove um, hateful monuments. And so we knew that. We knew that the city didn't have a process. We knew that for like 30 years, folks have tried to have the statue removed through through the city's, um, I don't know, through the city process, but there didn't exist one. So every time it was like, got to talk to that person, we got to talk to that department. But for artists, it is critical that we know what we're doing when it comes to this type of work or just all our work period, you know, that we know um, that the information that we have is accurate, that is coming from the communities that are most impacted by, by things. So the funny thing is that we knew that this piece of land here was controlled by Parks and Recs. We knew that this pedestal, this plant was paid for by the city council. So they had oversight over this. And the statue that sat on here, the Sarah statue that took all but like 20 seconds to, to remove. Um, and you saw how easy it was to remove. Um, that part was that statue or that that object was owned by um, the Department of Cultural Affairs, also part of their art collection. So to remove it, nobody knew from these three entities um, who had oversight over removing it. So, you know, we created our own process. Um, and the fact that the city now has has you know, pass this motion to figure out how they're gonna do this. And again, they passed it, they passed this last year, but no traction has happened as to like what this formal process is going to be. Um, again, these are these are these are areas in which artists can come in and develop this work, develop these policies. I firmly believe that if we do something right the first time, like with the care and intention um, and the knowledge of 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 what exists within within government structure that you only have to do them once. Um, I, I, you know, we've seen this past two years now that like the energy to go out and protest um, that that you know capital capitalism can try and wait us out. That all these inequities that exist they can try and wait us out and then find other ways to explo exploit it. Right with with um, with COVID we saw how that you know how even that that tragedy was exploited by capitalism. Um, so we try to do these things knowing what the policies are in place at the moment and where things, where change can happen. Um, and if there isn't something developed, you know, it's an opportunity for artists to create these things. Um, so going back to the video and to this moment, like we wanted to make sure that this wasn't, this was not seen as, a, as an action, that this was seen as a ceremony, that it was seen as um, indigenous folks and community members from all different backgrounds coming together to talk about healing, to talk about the harms that have existed, to learn about the harms that folks don't know have 
existed and continue to exist in the moment. And, um, you know, to be able to, to as a community um, have agency over how we heal, um, to have agency over how we're gonna hold the city accountable to these things. Um, and if we do it once, we don't have to do it again. We can, we can focus our energies on the aspects of healing, on the aspects, aspects of community building, rather than the legalistic side of, of the city. Let the politicians and them worry about that. As community members, we can, we can do this work without their permission. Um, but again, going back to resources, right? Like our communities are so taxed to try and do things out of pocket. Um, as artists, we do a lot of stuff out of pocket. Uh, the resources exist within our cities to be able to do this stuff, so we should have access to it. And, and that's kind of where the work is at at the moment. Um, and I thought I had a couple other slides here, but oh yeah, I think this one's just out of, out of sequence, um, but I'll come back to this. So I'm just going to go through some like what I call groundings and some folks might call best practices. I call them groundings because I think these are, these are strategies that center me and, and make sure that, um, that keep me accountable as an artist. Um, and none of what you've seen, like, do you see my photo <laughs> anything? And, I've, and I work really hard to make sure that that's not the case, um, that other people are like front and center um, because I don't need to be, um, it's not about me. So these are, these are questions that I ask myself anytime I do anything. Like who decided to do this action? Um, and if we don't know, and it's and it's it's you know one or two people, then maybe like we need to reconsider what's what's happening. Are the folks who are going to be most impacted by this by you know not just an action but like an exhibition even um, making a series of works? Um, are they part of this process? Are they included in any in any way, shape, or form? Then for this work, it's also like it's also been important to know who's in opposition, um, because there's always going to be somebody with a counter narrative to your work, um, and even them, even even them, are they participating in some form or another? With the Columbus statue, um, there was a lot of opposition to remove it. The day of, we expected folks to show up and and protest. Nowhere in sight. Sometimes people just want to be heard, and that's enough. So make space for them to be heard because that, that might be all they need to like vent and let go of in order to then find some sort of common ground and, and you know, have them understand some of these things as well. And I'll share a little bit of what happened in, in San Fernando with the Sarah statue there. Um, then what is actually happening, right? In this case, we framed it as a ceremony. This is what's happening at the start of it. We're gonna bring, bring people together. We're gonna make an altar. We're gonna share some songs. The toppling will happen some, at some point, but we want to be very clear afterwards too that the toppling is not the action, but coming together as a community, you know, at the height of COVID um, was the action. For many folks, it was the first time they had um, been out in public since the stay at home orders had happened in March. So March, April, May, you know, end of June, four months already, you know, kind of removed from, from, from a lot of folks. So for some people, it was really, really important. Um, and they showed up. So what, you know, make sure like what's actually happening is what people are understanding that is happening and who's controlling the narrative. As artists, you know, we get asked about our work a bunch of times, like, you know, you need to know that narrative, like, you know, the back of your hand so that the media or other folks who are, are gonna ask questions, like you're able to deliver the message that you want. And always, what are next steps? You heard Jessa in that video saying like, this is the beginning of things. And we wanted to communicate that to everybody that, that the toppling wasn't like the finality of anything. It was the start of something. And in order for us to be able to have the space to be able to do that, we needed to remove this thing. Um, and even just like the visual of, of saying that um, people get it, people understood it. And they're like, okay, we, we, we get this. We can, we can, go, with, we can go with this. Um, with the Sarah statue in San Fernando, the one that the, that the park, Parks and Recs removed, there was a man then that showed up before we even arrived. He was standing in front of the statue. 
Um, and he, you know, we asked him what he was doing. He's like, well, I'm here to protect the statue. Nobody's going to tear this down. Um, so he was adamant that he was just going to, you know, he was an older man, um, you know, um, hardcore Catholic. He's like, nobody's going to, nobody's going to damage this. And so we talked to him like, look, a group of youth just want to cover the statue up. They want to, you know, they want to be able to, to practice their, their first amendment right of protest. And that's all that's going to happen. And we, you know, we guaranteed to him that that we would ensure that like that would be the only thing that would happen. This man might not have understood everything else, but he understood the First Amendment and and you know the the right of free speech and protest. And he said, because I believe in the First Amendment, I'll support you. And his role that whole day was to go talk to other um, folks of Catholic faith who were there in counter protest. And let them know like nothing's gonna happen. The youth just want to practice their First Amendment right, and we we need to support them. The ability to be able to do that with dialogue and and like clarity and communicating certain things is is really really important. So somebody who would have been you know uh, you know um, we wouldn't have seen as an ally became an ally that day, um, and that is really really important for for artists to to understand that they have the power to do that stuff by by you know creative action even when other folks might understand might not understand what it is that you're trying to communicate they'll understand the act of 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 doing things um the importance of it so you just got to find ways to to you know to connect with folks community building um so how are elders included um intergenerational um I don't want to say audiences, but intergenerational intergenerational groups are really key to this. Um, as you see here, there's there's children. We we also wanted to communicate to folks that th these were families coming together and not activists, um, because that's what it was. Those families. Um, how are you participating? And then how are you bringing folks of diverse backgrounds together? There was black community members here. There was Armenian community members there. Filipino, um, other native folks. Um, from other, you know, from other, um, from other parts of the country who now live in Los Angeles. Um, so it was really, really diverse. It was, you know, it was a reflection of what Los Angeles is. And we wanted to do that specifically because we also want to make other folks, um, I use the word complicit <laughs> because it just sounds good, but you want to make other folks complicit in this too, because then they walk away um, just as invested as you are. Um, and that's what happened, you know, a lot of folks made a lot of noise afterwards because they felt included, they felt part of this, um, and people want to be part of good things. Um, so bring them on, bring them up, find ways to bring them along. And like I talked about reclaiming space, going back and offering people opportunities to, to engage. As artists, we put ourselves in the center a lot, but we can also create um, opportunities for other folks to come and participate. So that's, that's kind of one of the things that we've done. Um, for us, because a lot of this also comes from a ceremonial place, um, like that is part of how we do things. So how can we change how a space feels? Um, those same security guards that you saw in the video trying to stop us from toppling the statue now are the same security guards who welcome us back to these spaces. Um, when we did this ceremony in the fall, we left these ribbons up, these prayer ribbons, we left them up for a while, but we, you know, we took it, we, we committed to taking them down at some point so that they didn't become a nuisance to, to folks there. When we were taking them down, the security guards came over and they're like asking us to leave them because like, they're like, for the first time in a long time, you all brought color to this space. I was just dead. You know, I had the statue there, but it was just like, you know, a dead space. Um, so by changing the feel of it, right, we also change how the people that operate in those spaces on a day-to-day -day, um, act around it. So again, they try to prevent us from entering that space, but now they're the folks who open the gates for us whenever we go back. So that's like bridging, bridging people, right? Even if they don't understand what's happening, you're able to make them accept that these things need to happen so that all of us are in a better place. Um, Controlling the narrative, <laughs> important, important for all this work. As, along with prepping the media, which we did, we invited the LA Times to be there that day. 
Um, we invited certain folks because we trust these folks. Um, we invited them to be there. We gave them all the tools to be able to write a story that reflected what we thought was important to be shared with the with the world. Um, you know, so we wrote this, you know, we wrote this statement that was given to them um, days in advance. So when they showed up, they knew exactly like how to frame what was happening. Um, you know, the LA Times actually did like three different articles. As, a, as an artist, I feel that orchestrating energy is also part of the creative process. Figuring out like how things feel in the moment um, and creating the conditions for, for visuals like, like the one here with the, this person carrying the cross that broke off for these visuals to be captured and then shared with the world, right? Because we want things to go viral. That's, that's the new thing, right? How many folks can can share an image? Um, I'm big on, on later grams. Um, sometimes you get caught up in, in doing things that you forget to document things properly. properly. So I always try and, and have photographers, videographers um, on hand. Many times it's youth that we work with who will, you know, capture these images and, and they'll be published, you know, in, in the paper. These are resume building opportunities for them as well. So we prep our young folks to be present, take photos. Um, some of them have had their work published internationally now. Um, but we want to design a moment in which these type of images are shared. We did not know that Ali Taco, an, an online magazine of sorts, was going to produce that video. We invited them so that they can write a story. But the person there was so moved by things that they, you know, they produced a video free of charge. Um, and you saw how well put that video was because they understood what that day was, what that moment was, um, because we also prepped them in advance. Like, this is what's happening. So controlling the narrative is really, really important. Um, you know, the New Yorker wrote a piece on this. So the more tools you can give folks around what you're doing and, and your methodology, your approach to the work, the better um, these stories will be when it comes to talking about your work or these type of actions. And to this day, like the narrative that we set out to put in, 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 in motion for the Sarah statue, which was about healing, which was about reconciliation, is a narrative that has been used over and over and over, which is why the city now um, has moved to like formally apologize because that was the next step, right? There's, there's an acknowledgement, there's the reconciliation process, and then there's a the reckoning process. Like how do you pay, pay dues for what's, what's occurred? You know, re, you know, acknowledging and reconciling, that's great. But then you, got to, then you have to move, move towards like systemic changes. And that's the reckoning part, which is where we're at now, which is great. So these are some of the questions that I ask myself as to like, you know, in this work is like, you know, how can future mon monuments nurture people? You know, what can they do? It doesn't always have to be a statue. It doesn't always have to be this like, you know, cinder block thing. Um, can we imagine new type of monuments that engage in public space? How do they communicate to us, right? We shouldn't, I feel we shouldn't be kind of stuck in like this bronze and concrete model, but we can do other things. For me, oak trees, um, offers offers you know when they asked me like what would I put in place of the surf statue it was like an oak tree like that nature bringing back some of the land that was you know kind of the environment that was here before the city um, was was developed is probably the monuments that, that we should have an oak tree offers an ecosystem that is just amazing um, and the way it also communicates with other life forms is like we can learn a lot from. Um, an oak tree talks to insects, to the birds, to the animals, and it communicates about like what it needs to be nurtured. Um, it's just amazing, you know? And off of that, I developed this augmented reality piece um, that speaks to that. Um, so now when, when folks go to this, this, this place, there's a barcode there um, that launches this app and launches this AR project. And it talks about how um, through something called mycorrhizal networks, right? Like the oak trees use 
fungi to communicate with with other plants about um, the conditions of the soil. It communicates with insects about like what insects need to do to make the soil more fertile. Um, and if plants can do this and communicate with one another for like the betterment of each other, like why can't we as people do the same thing? So the intention of this 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 piece was to communicate that, right? Um, and I talked about also too, like changing the way in which we look at time um, through through the changing of the season. So you can see a little bit of the um, constellations there. Um, so my intention also too was bringing the stars a little bit closer to Earth because for Indigenous folks, time is isn't is not linear, and we also want to, or I also wanted to kind of remind folks that the the mission project is not a project that that like ended. It's 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 a continual project at the moment, and it continues to do harm now. So the idea of talking about these things as if they're in the past um, is also inaccurate. Like these things are happening in the moment still, so we need to account for them as well. Um, and so yeah, you know, going into and using technology in ways that that can change things. So this AR piece was launched two weeks before Indigenous Peoples Day, like right around the fall equinox. So again, changing the way these spaces operate, changing the way in which public space is used and who has agency to, to determine what that feels like, what that looks like. I think community members should have as much, if not more of an opportunity to, to, to control that than, than government itself. Um, so at the moment, after these like, you know, round of announcements, there's an opportunity to do that and not, you know, I'm not taking in any way, shape, or form full credit, or, or, or uh, you know, this. But this is where we're at now in Los Angeles because of this type of work. Um, so I also have to acknowledge all the many folks who have been part of this work, uh, which includes a lot of the tribal members from the Tongva and Tatagan communities, as well as other indigenous folks. Um, but that is a power of bringing bringing people together to do stuff um, through art, you know. You can you can make beauty out of these these ugly moments and these, you know these spaces that feel feel like they exclude us right. Um, so that's that's kind of been my work around around monuments and you know even the idea of, of um, you know folks kind of respond back with erasing history, but it you know like nobody's trying to erase anything. It's about expanding what we understand um, to be the histories of these places and how we engage in them. How we what we do um, what we do moving forward. Um, that is just being accountable to to our to our privileges that we walk with, um, and you know that's it. Just being accountable to the privileges that we walk with. We got to do something about that to like level the playing field. Um, we we exist in a in a in a system that um, that exploits you know it exploits all of us. Um, but primarily people of color. So I'm down to change that. <laughs> That's what my work kind of is, is about. So I'll stop sharing here and I'll open it up to like any questions. Thank you so much, Joel. And I, I think I'll go, I'll go first. And um, I wonder whether um, you have included in the conversation the Italian American uh, community considering about Columbus, obviously, um, considering the fact that uh, um, Italians, uh, I, I mean, that uh, um, Columbus monuments were uh, erected as a way to compensate uh, the mistreatment they got uh, as uh, immigrants. Italians, especially uh, Italians from the South. Uh, uh, were assimilated to uh, people of uh, color and they have been lynched uh, um, more than once. And, um, and so it was a way, and funnily enough, a weird way because, because Italians don't, you know, uh, they have an ambiguous relationship with, with Columbus. I don't believe, you know, they saw themselves into the idea of Christopher Columbus, but uh, uh, still it was a way, you know, to acknowledge something. I imagine that probably this has been lost in the memory and that probably now Italians American, you know, 
couldn't care less. I do not know. But since since you are very sensitive and in the indigenous approach, there's this sense, you know, of involvement, of community, of worrying about, you know, other people's sensitivities. I wonder whether you tried to have this contact and uh, how was it? Uh, and let me just add, I'm going to um, copy in the chat for everyone an article about the New York Times about um, about the history of racism against Italians, uh, Americans, especially from the South. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, to an extent. So when the replacement of Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day, there was a group of Italians who actually signed on to, to support um, the removal of Columbus Day. Um, the opposition that we've seen here in Los Angeles towards the removal of Columbus is has come more from the Catholic Church than from the, the Italian community. Um, down the street from where the Sarah statue was and down the street from Grand Park is the Italian American Museum at Olvera. Um, and they've also, you know, they have not been vocal any which way or the other. Um, but I know folks did try to engage um, the Italian community during during the process in which um, the Columbus statue is like moving through, uh, receive approval for removal from the county. Um, you know, It, for me, the idea of, of centering, centering the concept of whiteness in these conversations also like erases everything you just mentioned, Marina. Um, the idea of whiteness makes a monolith of, of folks of European descent. And it actually, you know, creates harm for, for white folks to not be able to talk about their, their heritage. Because the idea of whiteness here in the US is, is, is rooted on the, on, on the concept of, of, of manifest destiny, right? Taking land, developing it. And in order to do that, you have to remove the indigenous peoples of a place. Um, so when those conversations come up, um, I try and you kind of offer that too, you know, that, that by, by latching onto these images or these ideas of, of like Columbus and, and Sarah, um, it actually does harm the white people because it doesn't allow them to talk about their full heritage in a way that we hope they can. You know, for, for, for me and a lot of folks, getting, getting as close as we can to our root of who we are is the most important thing that we can do in this moment whether we come from you know, places like Africa or Mexico, um, there's pride in that, you know? And when, when folks really try and, and, and oppose these removals, they're, they're, a lot of times it sounds like they're opposing them because they don't know who they're connected to. And they don't know who they're connected to primarily because the idea, the idea of whiteness, um, it, it erases, the, the vast diversity of, of, of heritage that is within like European Americans. And so I think that's some of the work that also needs to happen alongside this work is that like we make space for white folks to reconnect to their roots um, and not just get stuck in, in the white frame of what the US has, has kind of imposed on people. Um, when, when, when that is offered up, the conversation changes dramatically. Um, the idea of Sarah is an idea of, of Sarah. He gets he gets um, credit for for work that he didn't do, um, but because the Catholic Church created this idea of Sarah in order to 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 canonize him, they also created the opportunity for people to latch on all the misdeeds that happened through the mission system onto Sarah himself. Is that fair? No, but that's a brand that the Catholic Church created. And so the brand around Columbus also kind of conflates a lot of things. So we also have to like untangle um, those histories 
so we get a true sense of who these people were and whether people want to celebrate them or not. When we, when we start talking about all the stuff that Columbus wrote himself and Sarah wrote himself in, in their journals, people don't want anything to do with them. That's the one thing we found is that people don't want anything to do with them once they hear from the writings, like how they, how they viewed the world. Um, you know, with Sarah, a lot of folks use that like he had a, a native bill of rights um, but in his own journals, he talks about, um, you know, the need to, you know, the need for corporal punishment, the need for slavery. And, and in fact, like his, his so-called Bill of Native Rights wasn't Sarah's way of protecting Native folks. It was his way of keeping Native folks away from um, the Spanish crown's control. He wanted control of Native folks because he felt he can take care, better care of them rather than use them for, um, for, for um, exploited labor to, to build buildings. He wanted, he wanted their labor for the, the purpose of the church. Um, so once, you know, once we get to the nitty gritty of stuff of, of, of like the details of these people, people don't want anything to do with them. Um, when the Sarah statue came down, we thought that the city would come and reclaim it in the moment, it sat there on the ground for like three days before anybody came and picked it up. And with the Columbus statue, same thing. When we when we deassessed it from the county collection, and the county, because it they have to do you know um, they have to do this, they offered it up. Like anybody who wants to um, receive the statue, because they were going to give it away, submit a proposal. This was put on you know public you know it was it was. It was sent out through the same channels that folks found out about the removal and nobody came to claim the Columbus statue. Nobody has submitted, you know, um, a, a, an RFP to like claim it. So at times it's, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's the idea of these things that we hold on to rather than the actual, the actual truth that we wanna hear. And when you hear it, people don't wanna be part of it. No, oh, sorry, I muted. Um, I, I got it. Um, on the other hand, uh, and, and I do know because I, I watched some videos in which you were talking, you, you also uh, investigated about uh, uh, the historical and uh, artistic values uh, of the statues. Uh, the, the first uh, meeting we had with Kendall Henry, he, he told us that in New York there were five or there still are. Um, maybe not no longer five, but there were five Columbus statues, which is unbelievable. Uh, and this tells us that basically it was a symbol more than you know uh, an actual uh, relationship to a historic uh, figure. Um, but not all the statues are the same, obviously. You know, some might have uh, a historic and artistic values, or some uh, won't. Um, so how, how about this? Because what freaks me out a little bit about, you know, cancel culture and the invitation, like the do it yourself, you know, toppling of the statue, which I, which I love because I come from a punk uh, background uh, as well. So, you know, I, I totally understand that. But on the other hand, you know, a, a superficial approach, which I know it's not yours, uh, can, you know, result in big mistakes. And, uh, you know, an acritical removal of uh, history doesn't lead to anywhere. So the relationship always has to be, you know, inclusive and, and critical. So tell me a little bit more, um, uh, if you want, about, uh, about the, the relationship towards the single statues. How did you investigate about the value and so on? Yes. So with the Columbus statue, the city, I mean, the county, was very adamant that it had an artistic value because it was a, it was a piece of art, according to them. Once we got down to it, it was a replica of another statue. So it was not even an original work, it was mass produced. So the same statue that was at Grand Park was installed in so many other different places. Um, so once they understood that, they were more open to exploring the removal of it. Um, and along the way, in order to like actually do this, they had to do they they had to have an appraisal um, to determine the actual like monetary value of this thing, not just the the um, artistic value of it. 
they spent about $1,500 to do this appraisal and the appraiser told them it was worth $0. It was worth nothing. So once, once we knew that, um, you know, their approach to it was completely different, but it also informed the Sarah statue because it was a, it was a, it was a statue that was installed in the same manner, produced in the same way. It was a copy of a copy. Um, and per the city code here, if it isn't, if, if, if what you do does, does not result in $400 or more worth of damage, no crime is committed. Like you, it's not an act of vandalism. So knowing that when we planned for the removal of the Sarah statue, we knew that if we toppled it, that it was worth nothing because we had precedent already. We had a, you know, we had another example of, of, of the Columbus statue being worth zero. And the fact that the county had, the county zone who did the appraisal um, has more, I don't know, I guess more authority than if we say like, well, this is worth nothing. You know, we, we can reference that. Um, so we knew that if we toppled the Sarah statue and the police showed up, that nobody would be arrested because we actually didn't commit a crime. Um, and that's what happened, the, no police showed up. But that was also possible because we communicated with the city about this. They knew about this. Um, we gave them enough notice so that they, that their impulse was not to react, but to make sure that people were safe. Mm -hmm. And so no police showed up that day. Um, shortly after, another group of folks who I don't know, I don't know who they are, um, toppled the, the George Washington statue at Grand Park, which is directly across from the, from the Columbus statue. Same type of object, installed the same way. Um, they didn't pay attention, they didn't see the zine. <laughs> so they toppled it um, and they were arrested. Six folks were arrested and they're being charged with felonies. They reached out to the county and asked them um, to press charges and the county wouldn't press charges because they couldn't. It's, you know, they asked for the value of the statue. They're like, well, it's worth zero dollars. Um, and so I don't know if these folks are still facing like criminal charges, but um, that, that level of research is really, really important because now across the city of LA and the county of LA, we have precedent of saying like, these things are worth zero dollars. They're only worth the amount of energy that people are willing to put into them. And we're spending so much more money in, in maintaining them where this money could be used for better purposes. You know, the Columbus statue sits in a, in a warehouse where the county's paying rent. Um, the Sarah statue was sitting in a county owned facility that was air conditioned, where at the same park where this was taken down, there is a homeless encampment because the city can't figure out what to do with the homeless population. So all that money spent on maintaining these things that are worth zero dollars could be better used supporting people. And this, is, and this is an important point of all the contradictions the world of art has. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in with questions. Um, I don't have a question, just like an observation. Um, yeah, so I think like it's really ironic how these statues of like symbolism and power like significance are worth so little in value. Um, and yeah, I really think it's like an old ideal that's outdated to have like a physical statue or like a symbol of power. And I think deconstructing that and also like things still taught in our public e education system, like um, growing up in America, I, um, you know, I was taught a lot of misconstruction instructions about Native Americans and it's still that colonization still is happening um you know and a lot of people don't really interact with those that identify as indigenous or Native Americans outside of their community so I think creating a space where these monuments stand you know that's really doing something for the community and for the people 
um, it's giving the indigenous community, like you said, uh, agency, um, you know, a place for them outside of reservations and stuff. And it's not, they're not something, uh, a people that's like, out of, you know, like far away, um, they're within our society and they need like a space there and also a space for people to be informed. And I think that it's like really powerful and um, progressive what you're trying to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all opportunities to unlearn things that, um, that we were conditioned to understand or to accept. Um, so I do believe, you know, like these are difficult conversations to have, but if you have them in, in gentle ways, um, people will stay engaged. Um, and again, like art offers an opportunity for us to, to do that with grace with one another, to offer folks those learning opportunities um, in ways that don't feel like jarring. Um, you know, sitting down and talking about these things um, on panels without like an, an opportunity to like process, I think is, is difficult. Um, but if we use art to like, you know, kind of do some of that, like people, people be more than happy to participate as difficult as it might be. I just want to drop in real quick and say um, I'm Emma, I'm a CCA uh, student and I'm also the chat moderator. Um, so anyone who is, doesn't want to unmute and ask questions, feel free to just put them in the chat and I'll relay them. Thank you, Emma. Um, I think it's also super interesting, the questions. Uh, the questions that you posed about uh, the future of monuments, because uh, basically this this is uh, all this seminar is about. You know, we 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 began talking about monuments, but then what's what's you know what's beyond monuments, and how can future monuments nurture? So you you proposed uh, oak trees and nature, but also technology as a means uh, to. Uh, to 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 memorialize, and um, I wonder whether um, this uh, approach, this alternative uh, approach, is is uh, and how is it being considered uh, by institution? You said that you, you just received some fundings, right, to to investigate and find new. New means. So, is this is this you know uh, um, is this becoming a prevalent approach? Well, I think so. It's an emerging field, if, if we want to call it that. Money, um, the Mellon Foundation what, is investing two hundred fifty million dollars to for this work um, nationally. That's a lot of money. Wow. Uh, so, and that's just one foundation, right? Um, Snapchat, I believe, is is also putting money um, like in a partnership with LACMA to do like augmented reality monuments. Um, I think, what is it? Um, I forget one museum also too, just launched like a augmented reality um, project around the city of LA. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are tools that we have to reimagine how space is used. And I think we should like as artists take full liberty with them we're gonna mess up along the way, but I think understanding that we're gonna mess up along the way also like offers a little bit of, 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 of like, you know, um, a little bit of grace to one another to, to, to understand that we're doing these things, um, trying to figure out what, what is best for all of us, um, rather than imposing like we, like, you know, I figured out that this is the way we're gonna do it and then like impose it on everybody else. Um, I think simply that alone, just understanding that we're going to screw up along the way is is a big shift from the way things have been, you know, been happening. Um, and that's important that like the, the that we're changing the way in which people behave um, to be more open to um, to the unknown. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know how things are going to shape up 
post COVID because we're still in COVID. We don't we don't know how things are gonna look um, after all this stuff with you know with with the violence that police are causing is gonna look like because we're still in it. Um, you know, and and I think the more comfortable we are with not knowing how these things might look, the better off we are too. And and then I would love to hear from you about the recontextualization and removal of memory. Like for instance, you know, in uh, um, in the concentration concentration camps in, in Europe have been transformed in uh, museums of uh, memory, and people could visit, can visit. I, I've, I was brought there as a child in Auschwitz by my parents, right? So uh, shouldn't we leave some of those monuments? Uh, to you know, with labels, with new labels, and so on, to 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 remind people that values shift, and that what once was believed to be you know an icon, uh, then uh, is is believed to be something something else. And so, should we remove everything, or should we also leave and recontextualize apart from the art historic value, which is another you know another layer? But also in terms of history. Um, yeah, I mean, for example, when here in Los Angeles, the San Gabriel Mission caught on fire last year, or it was set on fire by somebody. Um, and obviously some folks celebrated like, yeah, let it burn down. But one of the, um, one of the tribal community members here mentioned something that at least, you know, changed my perspective to that. Um, is one, these, some of these places contain a lot of historical information, whether documents, um, artifacts, um, ancestors, people's bodies. Um, we need to figure out what, what to do with those things. We need to figure out how those, those places are gonna be either more accessible to, to community or um, how those are returned to the tribes. Um, the, the unfortunate part too of, of like a place like the San Gabriel Mission is that supposedly the mortar that holds a lot of those bricks together is also made up of human bones, that bones were grounded into the mortar. Um, and um, that's crazy, that's craziness that that, that would be, you know, um, that that is actually real. Like that's just crazy that somebody would do that. Um, so those folks also need to like, you know, those, I don't know how you like, you know, repair that. I just don't. Um, what do you offer those families as, as, as any form of like dignified burial of, those, of their family members? You know, does that, building itself become that memorial right like and i think with similar with with the concentration camps like um it is it is yeah i, yeah, I just i don't know you know like i visited one myself and it's just it's, it's really jarring to like understand how you enter that space and i think germany has done a, a an amazing job in and educating folks about every single step of the way. Like this monument here is not a monument to like, you know, um, you know, to like celebrate anything. This is a monument here to remind us of like some fucked up shit that happened. Um, um, there's a lot to learn from Germany in that sense um, where, you know, they have these different, you know, these different titles for these different spaces on these different uses. Um, you know, I think one of the things that was shared when we were when I visited there was that when the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin was being produced, um, that they wanted to make sure that folks weren't confused with with the role that like some of these camps play by 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 keeping them up, right? And that folks understood that that memorial there was a memorial and it was in the site of one of the atrocities because that was also important for them to like convey to folks that this is just a memorial like if you really want to understand the horrors that that were caused by you know by the nazis 
then go to the camps. Like that place deserves its own, its own, you know, its own experience. Um, and we got to figure it out here, like what we do, like, do we, you know, destroy these missions at some point or do we keep them? Because like I mentioned, like within the mortar of the San Gabriel mission, apparently, you know, there's the remains of people's bones. It's heavy. Yeah, and it has to do with uh, the relationship with history, which is different from country to country. And uh, and so that, yeah, you know, like the conversation is is not about, you know, I, I use in the video that I shared with you to share with the students, you know, I use the idea of, of like removing, by removing the Sarah statue, I left the void, right? Like of energy and the object the, or that object ceases to hold any power. Like I mentioned, like it's, it, it laid on the ground for like three days before and you picked it up. So there's no power in that thing, right? There just isn't. It holds power as long as we give it power. But that void remains. Whether we let it fester and people just continue to be mad at one another because that object was removed or do we use, or do we fill that void with, you know, with the stories of other folks? Do we fill that void with, with opportunities to understand one another? Like what, what we do with that void is, is what's gonna heal us. Um, and so the less we focus on the objects themselves, the more we can focus on like, you know, understanding who we are. Um, Germany has done a really good job of taking some of these objects and just putting them in a, in a, in a museum with very little context. They're just objects. Some of these are beautifully made. So we're going to keep them because they're beautifully made and people deserve to see them. Some of them still have like bullet holes in them. And, you know, they made no attempt to repair them because that is their history. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to mess around with like trying to um, put a, a, a Instagram filter on them to make them look pretty. Like they just are what they are. Um, and I think being open about like these things just being what they are is, is an important way to go. Because then we can talk about the real stuff. So we still have four minutes. If somebody wants to step in with a question. But I do want to say that a lot of times we feel like we need permission to do this work. Um, and so if that's what folks feel they need, you have all the permission to go do this work. Um, and just, you know, build community along the way. Make sure that you like you do your due diligence to um, to bring people into it, the people that need to participate, the people whose you know, perspective needs to be part of it. Um, you know, public art, civic art is primarily done by straight white men so that also impacts you know women in a way that um that we need to make space for that within that field i think here in la i think it's like 90 percent goes to straight white men those commissions and those are huge commissions yeah so go take some of that back well, you know, when, when before you talked about um, uh, Christopher Columbus values or Junipero Sierra values, I was thinking, well, as a woman, if we would have to judge all the statues of all the men and the way they were thinking towards women through centuries, probably there wouldn't be any single man monument, you know, down there. We should talk about everything. So it, it is a little awkward in a way, you know, to judge nowadays things you know which happened centuries ago but it is true that icons are icons and, and uh, copies of copies of copies you know five statues of columbus i mean i was shocked when i learned that uh, and that through a, a rightful and uh, deep analysis of the history of the single you know objects and by building a culture of reconciliations and inclusion um, probably it is you know one of the of the possible approaches if not uh, uh, if not the only one so one minute <laughs> Yeah. 
if nobody steps in, I really want to um, thank everybody again, my my students and the CCA for CCA and Joel for this uh, very rich uh, and dense uh, talk. I was a little bit the advocate devil uh, as, as, as an Italian, <laughs> I had to, you know, towards Columbus. <laughs> And um, so thank you so much. I, I hope we were able, you know, to talk about uh, monuments and in, monumentality and anti-monumentality from different uh, perspectives. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>